Hello. <clears throat> wow, my voice sounds different. Okie dokie. So, um, as you can tell, this is going to be a very short slide, but let's just... Well, no, oh no. Oh yes, oh yes. <clears throat> so yes, my name is Nick. As you heard where I work, doesn't matter basically. But uh, today we're going to be talking about gears, the basics of polygonal modeling. <clears throat> now, um, this, is, this has more of a meaning, but which I'm going to elaborate later on. And uh, before I get to the demo, I'm just going to have a quick introduction to the software that is applicable to this, that is considered polygonal modeling. So <clears throat> we have about eight. So we have Max, uh, Cinema 4D, Maya, Houdini, Blender, Moto, 3D Coat, and ZBrush. These are all polygonal modeling programs with each uh, and their own additional quirky features and applicable to each their own tasks. <clears throat> so let's start with Max. Max is a really old piece of software that's been developed and is basically still on the forefront of the visual um, fidelity in the industry. Basically automotive and architectural visualization, Max is your go-to program. Why? Because there are plugins. Basically everything that is considered architectural visualization, realistic rendering, import, export, Everything uh, goes through Max. So if you're go going through political modeling and thinking about automotive or industrial design, or just visualization in general, Max might be your go-to. Then you have Cinema 4D. Again, a, a polygonal modeling program, but its specialty is in, um, in video, as it's kind of like Cinema 4D, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> Basically, uh, it has the most features which uh, have anything to do with video, as in particles, effects, video motion tracking. So if video is your thing, cinema might be for you. Maya. This is an interesting one because it's really not applicable anywhere but also everywhere. Because it's just a program that just works, but its biggest domain is the gaming industry, just because of everybody, just because everybody is using it. Then we have Houdini. Houdini, if you want to do generation, particles, simulation, cloth, everything, Houdini is your program to go. And then have Blender. Much like Maya, it goes everywhere and nowhere. It just depends on your use case and need. And it's slowly getting popularity each and every year, higher and faster. And now with the release of 2.8 in a few days, maybe a week, it's, it might just be the next big thing. Then we have Moto and 3D Code. These two programs came out of development as a direct competitor to Maya, but they're like very niche. The problem is they're very small programs which were developed to be exclusively competitor to Maya and nobody else. So the, the workflow and their use case really depends on the person itself. Like one has good texturing tools, one has a sculpting feature, one has both, but eh. So it really depends on your use case, but it's, these are two pieces of software that I can, hardly, uh, can, that I can full heartedly recommend. Then we have ZBrush, arguably not a polygonal modeling tool first, but a sculpting tool, but it has polygonal modeling options. So. What am I even going to talk about? <clears throat> Basically, all these programs that I just <clears throat> explained to you have different price points, different learning curves. What I'm going to show you now is that you can do exactly what I'm going to do now in each and every one of these programs. Because 90% of the features that I use is available in each and every software. So it's not really important which piece of software you use, but it's how you use it as we all know, but the industry says otherwise. So let's just go to the demo. Close it. Close this. This is very professional. So, <clears throat> we're just gonna open new, nah. How do you open a new document? God damn it. Doesn't matter. Okay. So this is the starting point. Now, as I said, the acronym GEAR stands for something much more. And basically, the first letters uh, correspond with the function of the program. Now, I'm going to use Blender because it's just my program software of choice it's the, since the last five years. And before that, I was a Max user for five years. So altogether, roughly 10 years of experience in this. 
Now, as I said, gears, we start with G. It means grab, a basic function in every piece of software. Now, E, E is an interesting uh, thing, because E means extrude, which is basically you take a, uh, a polygon, oh, this is a polygon. This, I'll, I'll just go back. This surface here is a polygon, this is a edge, and this is a vertice. And these are the things that make, make up 3D modeling. Why is the Z and Y inverted? Come on, <laughs> programmers. <laughs> Give me hardships. There, where, you don't have a Slovenian version. Yeah, it's Is it? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll trust you on that one. Why is it pink now? God damn it. Anyway, so, like I said, G moves things and E is extrude. So if I press E, I extrude polygons, vertices, sides, and everything out of the model. Again, I can just do individual sides. And just like that, individual vertices. Now, before I showed you G as in grab, I also could just grab each and individual piece of these objects. Basically, each function has one or multiple use cases. <clears throat> so now A. A means everything or all just basically selecting everything. So you can move everything as you wish. Then we're gonna go to R, R as in rotate. So as I said, each letter corresponds with the function. So if you just think what you're gonna do in the program, just think, oh, I would like to rotate something. So it's most likely R. But again, it varies from program to program. And the rotation can be in each axis any way I want it. <clears throat> so then we have S, the final one. S, scale. Again, scaling the object. Basic functions. And already you have basically 50% of the functions you need to do polygonal modeling. Now we're gonna do something funky. We're gonna delete a face. So the F, F letter. F stands for fill in. So if I select if I select uh, edges that I would like to join together, press F and it fills everything in. I can also do that just for vertices. It's just gonna join or connect these two things that I connected and it's just gonna make a connection between them. And then V. <clears throat> v means rip for whatever reason. Basically, if you select an edge and press V, you basically unconnected something. And it basically made an oven or a washer. Depends on your use case. And then we're gonna do something a little bit, well, different, much like everything. We're gonna select these two vertices and we're gonna join them. This is the function M alt, basically just merging. You can merge in about six different ways, by distance, by vertices, by this and that, and just open the whole possibility of how you want your object to move and how much control you have over it. And then we have shift D, duplicating. Now, you may be thinking like, why are you showing us all these basic features? You will see. There's still more to come. Now, again, if we select everything, each and every polygon, side, edge, and press Control B, we get to the bevel, which basically just makes the sides smooth. And then we're gonna do mirror. I'm going to add a cube, select this cube. I don't know the shortcut for this one. Just mirror it over this. Mirror. And right now, on this piece of paper, I have a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, okay, maybe eleven. Eleven basic features to show that it doesn't matter which program you use, it's just how you use it. Because all these features are freely available in each and every modeling program. 
Now we're going to open up the previous one, open recent. <coughs> or let's let's do something different. Let's let's go to. Uh, oh, you know these those things um, for cross uh, to cross the street, like the little blue things. How would you how would you call them? The little blue boxes on the the thing on the streets when you click it, it goes t -t 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 -t, when you cross it. How do you call it? Those crosswalk signals? Blind box. What? Uh, blind box. Sure, whatever. <laughs> Basically, this. <clears throat> For this example, I decided to model this to give an example what you can do with those basic features and how I decided to recreate this. So unlike Micha, where he was doing it live, I decided to do this before, every, uh, before the meeting and just give you an explanation of how I did it. So this is what I created. <clears throat> and these are going to be the steps of how I decided to do this. Why did it, no, why did it open in this? Why, uh, oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I just, I just need photos. I just need photos. Nothing special. Okay. <clears throat> so basically, to start off, we just need a basic shape. So a rectangle. Then you need to bevel it. Of course, Control B to give the sides a little bit of definition. Then we, I decided to do the sides again. Just add little details like extrusions on each and every one of those. Again. This is just a function called extrude, and then I beveled each and every one of these uh, these little sides separately, so it gets a nice little rounded feel to it. <clears throat> then I gave it a hat. I also beveled it. And then I beveled it again in a different direction, because the way you uh, go about modeling these things, there's a way to mess it up and start it over again. So. Every time you model something, you have to think, what am I going to add to this? Am I going to uh, bevel it here? Am I going to move it there? Cut it here? Texture it like this? Will it go for a game? You always have to be thinking about how to approach this. And this step was very crucial, because you couldn't do it the other way. Well, you could, but you kind of don't want to. When you get it f um, more accustomed to this, you will realize why. Then I added the bottom portion. This, again, could be a mirror function or a duplicate function, and using rotate. Then I added the little circle on top. Then I added the narrow. Then I joined it. You can't really notice it. Then I added the bevel. Again, you can't really notice it, but when you talk about rendering and shading, it's all very, very much noticeable. OK, there's five steps here. Then I added a cutout for the little screws. This was a pain to do. It basically took me, I think, two, three hours to figure out how to do correctly. Then I mirrored on the other side. Then I added to the bottom. Then, if you look at the side, I deleted the side and basically just made it flat. Yeah? What was the problem uh, with the screw holes? The screw holes. Basically, I wasn't thinking when I was modeling this, despite knowing exactly what I'm going to do, how I'm supposed to cut it. And uh, there are polygons up here that, well, I use the Boolean modifier. Basically, add the object, add a different object, and just cut it out. It just leaves a very, very dirty mesh, and you have to hand fix each and every part, which I'll show you later on, if requested. <laughs> So, like I said, I smoothed everything out, then I added into sections, then I added the detailing, what happened here, then I made another front here, added some more detailing, covered that detail. Now, you can see that something happened here, but you can't really see why, but I'll again show you on the 3D render, I just didn't think about adding the other side to the renders. Then I added the pole, this, and basically this is the whole walkthrough of how I did it. Now this looks very simple. Uh, it uses, I use the very basic functions that are, as I said, available in each and every program. The difference is this took two weeks to model. And I don't mean like, oh, two weeks as in eight hour days. No, basically just, let's say, one to two hours a day because I had a plan to make the, the high poly version and then to texture it. I finished the basic model in three days. Everything else took two weeks. Now, 
<clears throat> this is, uh, as I showed you, the model, and this is the back. Not everybody notices the back, but when you take reference photos of this, you kind of notice there are details that you didn't notice before. And kind of the basics of polygonal modeling, the devil is in the details, much like everything else. But you saw the high poly render, and then you look at this one, and you see that only the black lines are polygons. Everything is a texture. So as I said with this part here, this was a bitch to do, but when I finished it, and I'm baking and finishing the topology, everything works now. Now, you might be asking yourself, why would you bake or texture something like this? Now, for video games, you kind of want everything to be very, very optimized. And with this model here, all the orange lines are polygons. Even just this has about 5,000 polygons, and the low poly model has 4,000 all together. <clears throat> now, the whole object here that you see has about 275,000 polygons. So it's very crucial to optimize, make it low poly, bake it as much as you can. Now to give an example of this, this is how it looks fixed. <clears throat> and this is still not correct. There are stray polygons not connected to anything. You basically have to use tricks to fix it. And I also asked a few questions on our 3D forum, on Facebook, and so on and so forth, how to fix this. There are actually many people that came to my rescue to help me fix this. But it just took so much time that I just decided to hack it. Now, oh, there we go. OK. These are all the reference photos I have. I basically took about 20 photos, same shape, same distance, same size. But it's only four that you need, really, of each side. I have the side, both sides, the top, and just a few uh, pictures from the back. So in summary, polygonal modeling uses polygons, vertices, and sides, or edges, to model. And you can do exactly the same model in each and every program that supports polygonal modeling. Also Blender. So this kind of concludes my short talk. Any questions? Also, this was kept short and intentionally because this could have taken a long time to actually show off. Did you use any substance designer? Did you use substance designer to yes. make textures? The texture was made completely in substance. No, uh, substance painter, not designer. I basically bought the metal textures and just roughed them up in just like with the generators. Uh, by hand, I added these details, played around with the transparency. I actually wanted to add light to this, but it was just a bit complex, let's say. Because also each render engine, like this is Marmoset Toolbag, if you put it in a game engine, the workflow is completely different and Blender is completely different. So you really have, <clears throat> when you make something for something, you know you should know what you're making it for and adapt to it. There's no one solution for everything. So when you made uh, textures in Substance Painter, you then imported all those tox textures into a Marmor set? Yes. Basically, I imported the model from Blender to Substance, textured it there, exported the textures to Marmor set, and then added on the decals in Photoshop because it's just much faster. Uh, how about those side side uh, buttons that are in the yellow area? Are those this normal? is just this is a normal? Yeah, everything yeah. is a normal. Oh, uh, so. so where did you get those normals from? Uh, high poly mesh? Yes, everything okay. is baked. As you can see, yeah, the whole sides are flat. There is no actual detail in this. But just going through the layers themselves, this is these are the colors that are baked in, basically transferred. These are the ones that represent reflectivity, so all these things reflect a certain way. Or just metal, and these are the glossy parts. Again, the topology, it's you, all flat. Did you use the substance painter for baking? No. Blender? No, designer. I mean, yeah, painter, sorry. 
Okay. The fan awesome. is very loud. Yeah. Okay, cool. It was a very easy project. It just took a lot of time because I knew what I was gonna, trying to achieve with this. Now the question is, did I achieve it well enough for everybody else to understand? All heads going up and down, not left and right. Good. Any more questions? No? Okay, then we'll take a short break. Just grab a beer and Adam will prepare next. Thank you. So let's continue with the next talk. Um, Adam will show us how to expand the Unity Editor. So the idea here is that uh, I won't be showing a lot of stuff, like learning stuff. I will be showing things that are done because we don't have that many time. So I will be showing a lot of these things. If you're interested in what I'm showing, there is a link somewhere in this QR code. I don't know why I did QR codes. They were cool like 10 years ago. So you can scan it. You can take a photo of it. So what would you learn and forget after going home? Uh, for developers, I will basically go some, over some basic inspector data validation, again, developers, uh, running scripts in the editor, custom editors, cool examples, I did them, so they're cool, and other useless tabs, and you should really be programming game and not custom editors. And for artists, uh, the presentation has nice gifs, so, you know. And every code example contains a gif of a cat, like that one. <laughs> So the main thing about uh, custom editors, or the most basic thing, is inspector data validation. This means like clamping values, character stripping. It basically allows you to, for example, block anything from being over 10, for example, or allowing all the characters but not A for some reason, or making sure that if a file is missing, you know that the file is missing. The idea here, as you can see in all that, code if it's visible, is that we are using first if it's Unity Editor, because we don't really care if this code goes into production. I mean, it shouldn't go into production. This is supposed to be only on the editor. And basically, if it's inside here, it will prevent this code from going into the game. And then the main function that does this is on validate. This function will basically allow you to know when something changed on the inspector, and then you can do whatever you want with it. In this case, for example, the first one is uh, checking that the value is not more than 10, and then it sets it to 10. For the character, it just checks if it contains the letter A, and then it removes it. And for the thing that was checking if the asset was there or not, it just checks if it's there or not, and paints some things or some other things. It's pretty simple. It's not even custom editor, per se, but it's the first thing that you do regarding custom editors. Then the other thing is running scripts in the editor. So basically, the idea here is that you can run any script that you would run on a normal game, also on the editor when you're not playing the game. So for example, if Jack here, here is playing, but as soon as, I, as soon as I start playing, it still moves the ball, even though the game is not actually playing. This entire logic goes by putting this execute always on top of the class. And the only thing that this will do, it will basically run whatever this is under, even though the game is not actually playing. Uh, don't use the execute in edit mode, because apparently it's obsolete, but nobody says that. So execute always is the good one. <clears throat> uh, and then some other useful stuff to use with execute always. You have one method, which is application is playing, which basically allows you to know if the game is playing or not. And editor application queue player loop update, which is a very long method that basically will trigger an update like the game would do. The idea here is that execute always is not that reliable, and for whatever you want to do, maybe not be the best thing. So you have the documentation there for specific cases. And now for the cool stuff, custom editors, which you have the description there. But you have an image. This is a normal editor that you would have. And this is a cool editor where you can play Pong in the editor if you really want to. Uh, that's what custom editors are. I mean, not, not really these, but you, you get the idea. Uh, if you want to check how this was done, this was done by some ABBA games guy. I think he has more stuff. So if you really want to play Pong in the editor, you can. So there are a lot of things to do for a custom editor. I cannot go over them. So I just go through very basic stuff. The main thing is that any script that is an editor must be inside a folder named editor. Otherwise, it won't work. Uh, to override the components editor, you must use the custom editor attribute on top of the class. 
and editors are drawn mainly on the inspector key method. So basically, if you create a script, you put it in an editor uh, folder, you put the custom editor on top of the class, and then you do whatever you want on the on inspector key class method. Uh, and all of these will be used as information in a couple of months when Unity changes this because they like to do that. They did this new UI elements API. You have the code there if you want to check the announcements. But yeah, apparently they are changing this, so none of this is useful. Uh, and now we'll show you some cool examples because it's better than random code. As I said, the Unity editor has hundreds of different methods and fields and properties for custom editors, so it's literally impossible to show them all. So I will show you some examples that most of them are open source on GitHub, so you can just go through them if you want. I will show you ex exactly what those examples are mainly useful for, and then you can just read through the code if you really want to. Uh, this first thing is called section attribute. If you know, you can put uh, headers on top of basically any field in the inspector. This thing basically allows you to do that, but also put descriptions and separations and stuff like that. If you want to read the code, the main thing about this to learn is the property drawer and property attributes, which are basically just custom editors, but for small fields, and not for the entire thing. So if you really want to learn about this, just check the code and you can see how it works. Then I did this a long time ago, so please don't use it. It's uh, a multiple, so an expandable object pooling for Unity. The best thing to check here is not actually what this thing does, but instead the editor. It has nice, like, editor gui layout help boxes, which is this nice thing where you can put things inside, like the versioning and stuff like that. It uses pop-ups, which are basically the drop-downs that you can get when you're changing layers or tags on Unity. And it uses the application is playing, the draw properties excluding, which basically allows you to render the, the normal editor and the custom editor at the same time, and uses serialized objects, which are the main thing about custom editors. Again, I cannot show you all of this. It's just if you're really interested about one of these things, you can check the code yourself. And custom script icons, yeah. Uh, in this case, it's more of a visual thing. I don't have the code public for this, but if you want to play the game, it's there. Uh, this game was made for Loom there, so I created this script uh, custom editor in like two hours. And the main idea was that the editor in here would allow to create uh, levels for artists or whoever doesn't understand how levels work. And it basically allowed a lot of time to be saved in the end because we could just create levels and duplicate them without having to go through scenes and prefabs and stuff like that. If you can see, the custom editor just has a custom grid in the center, and then it has drop-downs where you select what you want. So for example, here the player is the pink thing, and the green things are the level exits, the 10 number thingy. So if you change any of these, the level at the end will change. And this one in specific was using this editor gate chain checks, which check if you, for example, change the grid size, it would reorganize the, the list in here. Again, a bunch of stuff. This, I think, is the best example of an artist-friendly and time saver editor. The other ones are just for like nice things, but this one actually helps. So, and here's some other stuff that it's not public. Uh, in this case, I wanted. I have two monitors. I work with two monitors, so I cannot press the play button because there is something else on top. Normally, Chrome. So this basically just puts the play button somewhere else. Really, custom editors. It can help you in the smallest things that you can imagine. You really don't need to do anything big about it. If you want to move the play button, you have it in another place. It's that useful, really. In it also, I added some like uh, lock and reload assemblies. If you check the buttons at the bottom, if you click those, it blocks from the editor from compiling. It's just something, so yeah. And then I created this. This should be public at some point, but it's not because it's not finished. But the idea of this was to be able to create toolbars of whatever you like to have on a toolbar. So you would be able to create buttons and put textures on them and call methods from them. So this should at some point be public, I guess, if I finished. And now the cool thing that I wanted to show is the hook interceptor, which I did like a week ago. And the idea is that you can use the Stream Deck, this thing here, or literally anything that is like apps for phones if you don't want to spend the money, or you can make a website, really, anything. The idea here is that you can call the Unity Editor from literally anywhere to do anything. And now it's a simple demo. So the main idea of this is that it just works like a link on a website. 
Apparently, the Unity editor has a callback, the same way that uh, an application would have a callback. So, for example, you maybe encounter when you're on your phone and you click a Facebook link, and it doesn't actually open the Facebook web page, but it opens a Facebook app because it knows that you wanted to go to Facebook. This is kind of the same thing. The editor will work like that when you, for example, want to go from the asset store to the editor. There is a button that says Open in Unity, and it will actually trigger the Unity. So we can actually hack that and listen for this thing, and instead send anything to it. In this case, I, I don't know if this is visible, but it has like a bunch of buttons. And the idea here is that the editor is not playing or anything, but it's listening for callbacks to this asset store. And instead of sending an asset store, I'm just sending a link with custom data that then I parse. So here it's pretty simple. If I click the blue button, it enables an object. If I click the green or the red, it enables another one. It's a pretty simple example, but you can basically do whatever you like with this. So this is just a very short explanation of what custom editors can do for you. Because none of this will be on a final release build. No, no one will see this. But if it makes your life easier or, I don't know, you like to do it, it's a really good thing to spend some time and learn. Because I've never seen that many custom editors in the wild. So maybe it's a good time to start doing some stuff, even for the artist. I mean, they need this kind of sometimes. So yeah, that's mainly it. If somebody wants me to show something, let me know. But that's about it. Any questions? Can you show the stretchy cat editor? No. Please. <laughs> I don't have it here. Ah. I think. Okay. Let me check. Uh, maybe you're lucky. Was it 44? Yeah, it was 44. Any other question? Well, this note. I don't even know what it is, by the way. Yeah. So yeah, this is it. Uh, I don't know if I can change it and you will see it, but let's see tutorial, I guess. Pretty simple, it has like the player, normal planned, and then level exit. I can change this and say now the grid size is instead of 3 and 1 will be 3 and 5. And I can recalculate the grid. And then I can just add some spacing in here, for example. And add, I don't know, get like a single obstacle. That's about it. And now, if nothing breaks, it should work and it should show that level that I just created. Yeah, there we go. So it has like the three levels, the bottom, and then when you finish, it just finishes the game. So it's that simple to create levels, and when we were doing this, but pretty fast to do new levels, because it just works. Anything else? Um, hey, uh, did you ever check out the Odin Inspector? And what do you think about it? I've been using it for like two years now, and I think it's one of the best uh, tools until now for the inspectors. I, I did check it out. I didn't use it that much because I want to do my own custom editors. But definitely, if you are in some production and you just started it, because if you just didn't start and you came to something that was already there, it will take a long time to merge those things to another editor. But if you just started, it's definitely a good idea. I think it's what, like 40 euros, something like that. And it just has everything that you could imagine that Unity has not. And it just works as far as I'm aware. So it's a pretty good idea to use it. So that's it. Thank you, Adam.